Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Dr. Ellen Stein will be speaking about everything you need to know about colon cancer prevention. Before we get started, we like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenter. The last 30 minutes will be a dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note if you do not want your name attached to the question, please check send anonymously. Also, your email address will not be shared with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all questions we've received during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Ellen Stein to begin our presentation. Hello, hi, how are you out there? Um, today, we're going to talk about everything that you need to know about colon cancer prevention. I think it's really important to understand um, in the wake of uh, Chadwick Boseman's death um, that these cancers can be preventable um, and that we have something that we can do for everyone to help prevent colon cancer. Um, and I think it's very important um, that we all start talking about colon cancer risk um, amongst our families um, and we talk about colon polyps, not exactly a popular conversation, but something that could change someone's life, something that could save someone that you love. Um, and I think it's really important. So today we're gonna learn some facts, uh, get some answers, and I wanna applaud all the other divisions around the country who are trying to reach out to people to get the knowledge out there. Um, there's something called the Katie Couric effect. So Katie Couric had a colon cancer screening live on screen, and that year colon cancer screening rates increased in the entire country and thousands of people may have been saved. So take this time and, and do the right thing. So let's talk about the agenda today. We're gonna to talk about risk factors for colon cancer, the latest guidelines, and many of them have just come out in the past year and the importance overall of screening. So prevention equals screening. Um, a screening test is one that detects a cancer before it occurs and prevents the cancer from happening. Um, there are many ways to get screened for colon cancer if you're an average risk patient. This is someone without a family history of colon cancer, no symptoms, um, and who just reaches the right age for screening. There are stool-based tests, meaning you poop in a cup, and there are structural examinations, ones that examine the structure of the colon and kind of find out whether there's something to worry about. There are three stool-based tests in general. There's a high-sensitivity guaiac-based fecal occult blood test. If you're gonna use that screening modality, you get it every year. There's a fecal immune testing, or FIT, which is needed also every year. And there's a multi-target stool DNA test, which you need to get every three years in order to be properly screened. There are structural examinations like colonoscopy, um, where we insert a camera throughout the colon, and that happens every 10 years, and it can detect and remove polyps all in one session. Um, and it's the only one of these tests that can do that. There's flexible sigmoidoscopy, which uh, can be done every five years, which can also remove polyps in the left-hand side of the colon. And there's virtual or CT colonography, where you take a picture of the colon and reconstruct it with CT scan uh, technology and you get that every five years and you can detect most of the larger polyps that will be causing trouble, but they miss some of the smaller polyps. For higher risk patients, those with a family history of colon cancer or colon polyps, you might need to consider colonoscopy as the best option for screening because with higher risk patients, you really wanna be able to find and remove those polyps. So screening positive. So if you took a stool test or a CT colonography, and the screening test comes back positive, that means that something was detected that might um, indicate that a colon cancer or colon polyp is present. Usually it's just a colon polyp, but at this point a colonoscopy will be needed. Colonoscopy allows the polyps to be identified and removed safely. And on the right side of your screen, you can see a drawing of a colonoscope, which is a long flexible tube with a lighted camera on the end, and you can pass little devices through the lumen of the tube, and you can move polyps all through the scope. Um, so there's no surgery here, you just do everything through the scope, and it's a great test. 
What are the overall benefits of colonoscopy? Well, colonoscopy is used to find those polyps, which are small growths in the colon. Over time, if you let these growths stay in the colon, they continue on their path and can become cancerous. So the American College of Gastroenterology, the American Cancer Society, and the American Gastroenterological Association all recommend that anyone who reaches the age of 50 have a screening exam. And we'll talk a little more about some earlier uh, starts to that screening. A colonoscopy is also recommended for some people younger than 50 who have a family history of colon cancer. And if you're having symptoms, now that's not a screening colonoscopy, that's a diagnostic colonoscopy, meaning you're investigating why someone is having bleeding from the rectum, diarrhea, or a change in bowel habits. That's something you should definitely talk to your doctor about, and you should get checked out right away. So we know that screening saves lives, um, and this is a good thing. A normal colonoscopy, according to the recent U.S. Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer, is associated with a sustained, reduced risk for incident and fatal colorectal cancer. So colonoscopy pr protects, is protective and it finds polyps. Now what to do if polyps are found? Now this just past year, the, uh, there was a uh, universal recommendation for follow-up after colonoscopy and, pol and polypectomy. And the consensus update was, again, from this U.S. Multi-Society Task Force. All of the major GI societies got together, and they said if you had a high-quality colonoscopy, which is defined as a complete, they saw it all the way through to the end, which is called the cecum, if they had a good bowel prep, a clean view, which was sufficient to detect polyps that were very small, um, and an adequate colonoscopist adenoma detection rate, that's a marker that your colonoscopist, the doctor who does your exam, it does a good, careful, thorough job. And if the polyp was completely removed, they risk stratified when people should return for their next colonoscopy. So if you had a normal colonoscopy, you'll come back in 10 years. If you had one to two small polyps, then you might come back in seven to 10 years. If you had something called a sessile serrated polyp, then you may come back depending on the size in five to 10 years and so on. As the, there are greater numbers of polyps, you may come back sooner because the risk of another polyp forming gets higher. And your doctor will work through these guidelines to make sure that you're coming back at the right intervals. So let's talk a little bit about colon cancer development itself and how we can learn about those facts that will prevent it. So we'll talk about the adenoma to cancer sequence. We'll talk about epidemiology. We'll talk about risk and protective factors. We'll talk a little bit about young colorectal cancer and inherited conditions, symptoms, and then we'll go over those screening modalities one more time so that you can have another look at what's out there uh, because the right test is the one that's going to get done. So let's review first the way that colon polyps may develop into cancer over time if they're not removed. So this is a sequence that was developed um, and pioneered um, uh, by Dr. Giardello, who is one of our own Hopkins doctors. Um, and these are some of his slides that he shared with me. So if you're thinking about colon cancer, about 30% of colon cancers are uh, found in the rectum. And about 30% of colon cancers are found in the left side of the colon. So that means about 60% of colon cancer is found on the left side of the body. The right side of the body, or the right colon, is home to about 41% of detected colon cancers. And that's why a full and complete colonoscopy will get those patients who have a right-sided colon cancer. And that's what's so important about your bowel prep too, that we can see through to the right side. Now in the sequence that happens, there are a series of changes in the genes that may tell us about the pathway. They don't necessarily happen in this order, but there are APC genes and KROS genes and DCC and the loss of 18Q and P53, all fancy kind of genetic things that they have been very clearly worked out. But what it means is that this is a small adenoma. It's benign, and this is where things begin. If you follow the sequence over time, then you will develop a small to medium-sized polyp, then a larger polyp, and some of those changes in the genes cause something called dysplasia, a change in the lining that's a little step closer to cancer. And if you don't take out the polyp and it has more time to grow, you get a carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma, which is a cancer. And the cancer can be located within the polyp, but you can see here, it's extending through the polyp into that submucosal space, and that's where um, you can get spread beyond the polyp. 
And if you don't act, then you can get an invasive carcinoma, which goes through the lining, through the wall, and can become widespread. So we really want to find the cancers way back here, when they're very small, rather than here, where the cancer is already um, gone beyond the colon. So these are some, as my kids say, these are kind of gross, but these are pictures of polyps. These are adenomatous polyps. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see white light endoscopy, which is the traditional method of doing colonoscopy. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see with modern technology, you get a much better picture with high-definition scopes. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see they're kind of putting a little lasso around the polyp. They're going to wrangle that stalk, and then they're going to cut off the polyp and remove it all through the scope. Um, and that's what we can do these days. These are more advanced lesions. So if you leave those polyps over time, they can erode into the wall of the colon. And also, if there are certain types of polyps that laterally spread, they spread along the flat surface of the wall, some of these laterally spreading lesions can be removed, but some of them already have cancer inside. Um, and so we really don't like to let polyps grow to be this large. And that's the purpose of screening before they get to be big. Let's talk about the epidemiology. So colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in the US. 147,000 cases per year, of which there are about 53,000 deaths per year. And we know that there's no medical treatment. Medical treatment is not curative for colorectal cancer. Now let's talk about what everybody's worried about um, in the wake of some of the early cancer deaths. People are noticing a trend and there is a rising incidence of colon cancer in the young. So this is um, a table, um, a graph that shows the percent of a particular age at diagnosis and the year of diagnosis. And on the left-hand side is 1970s and on the right-hand side is the 2010s. And you can see that over time, there are more cases in young patients. And this came from a study um, in clinical colorectal cancer by Casey et al in 2018. And we can see that young onset colorectal cancer also for this study has a greater tendency to be found in the distal location, the rectum and the left side of the colon um, compared to the right side of the colon. Uh, okay. So this slide shows the different deciles. That means in your less than 29s, so you 20 to 29, there's an increase in the rate or incidence of colon cancer. In the 29 to 39 year olds, there was an increase in the diagnosis of colon cancer. In the 40s to 49s, between 1970 and 2010, there was also an increase in the rate of detected colon cancer. So this is a real trend. And we can see that trend um, is present in both white and black patients. And so it's rising in all patients who are less than 50. It's something we're observing. Now, if you look at colon cancer deaths by age, most of the people who die of colon cancer are older, and only a very, very small percentage of patients are younger than 40. But it's important to also know that the lifetime risk of colorectal cancer in the US is 4.3%, with about 90% of the cases occurring after the age of 50. So most people who get colon cancer are not young, but there is a larger number of young patients getting cancer. And I would say this, if you have any symptoms, rectal bleeding, change in bowel habits, any warning signs, that's a good reason to go right to the doctor. Don't wait until you turn 50. Go to the doctor then and get checked out. Ignoring symptoms is one of the things we sometimes see in younger patients. And now that we know about this risk, we as physicians take you very seriously. So there are recent reductions overall in colorectal cancer in the US. And we have attributed that to widespread uptake of screening with colonoscopy and other methods. The more we screen, the more cancers we find before they become cancers. So if you think about the leading causes of cancer death in the US, lung cancer has a little over 150,000. Colorectal cancer is the number two cause of death from cancer just before breast cancer. Now let's talk about some risks and protective factors. So if you think about all colorectal cancer, uh, most colorectal cancer is actually sporadic. Um, it just happens. And a small portion or fraction is hereditary. Now there are a couple of different types of hereditary colon cancer, FAP, HMPCC, and familial colon cancers. 
FAP is familial adenomatous polyposis, and you get thousands or hundreds of little polyps all throughout the colon. HMPCC, or hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, is associated with a series of different medical conditions that could be found in some families, and taking a really good family history is a good way to find that um, syndrome. And familial are all those people who have family members who had colon cancer, and we'll talk a little bit more about that now. So why does family history matter? Well, first I have to say that colon polyps are not exactly popular dinner conversation, but I ask everyone who comes to get their colonoscopy, please talk with your family about what we found today. This will affect their risk, and if you can convince your brother or your sister or your mom or dad it's time for their colonoscopy, you could save their life. When you know about someone's family, you know about their risk for colon cancer. So a person with a family history of colorectal cancer or a documented advanced adenoma in a first degree relative who is less than 60 years old or two first degree relatives with these findings at any age, they are recommended to go screening uh, for, by colonoscopy every five years beginning 10 years before the age at diagnosis of the youngest affected relative or starting at age 40, whichever is earlier. So if, you, if that's you, if that's your family, then you need to be asking for your colon cancer screening to start at 40. For persons with a single first degree relative diagnosed at over, 50, over 60 years with colorectal cancer or an advanced adenoma, they can be offered average risk screening, meaning every 10 years, beginning at age 40. And this is again from that US Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer. So there is a special risk which you should know about. The greatest relative risk of colorectal cancer appears to be in persons who are less than 50 years of age with a first degree relative who had colorectal cancer at less than 50. So if someone in your immediate family had colon cancer before age 50, that's a really high risk person and you should be screened, uh, you should have a gastroenterologist. Um, there are some risk factors that we know increase the risk of development of there are some strong risk factors. Now, these increase to a four times greater risk. We just talked about family history, but also age. So as people get older, we saw that colorectal cancer risk increases, and also country. We know that in westernized countries, we tend to have a higher rate of colon cancer. We also talked about FAP and HMPC, and then there's also Putz-Jaeger syndrome and juvenile polyposis, which have a strong risk. Um, a ureterosigmoidoscopy is just a really complicated word for a little tube that um, drains urine into the sigmoid, and if you have that condition, you have an increased risk. There's a moderate risk found two to four times greater than average in people who have a history of an adenoma or carcinoma, people with pelvic radiation therapy, somebody who had a young uterine or ovarian cancer, a condition called dermatomyositis, which is a, a skin condition, and anybody with inflammatory bowel disease is on a uh, uh, heightened surveillance for colon cancer regimen. There, there are a few other um, risk factors, but we won't go over those. Now, this is the interesting one, and this is the one you have the power to change. So we know that if you have a diet that is high in red meat, a high fat diet, a high calorie diet, if you're a smoker, if you have an excess of alcohol, or if you um, are overweight or obese, you do increase your risk up to twice normal for um, your risk for colon cancer. And those are some things that we may be able to change. I think those are the important ones that we have the power to do something different. So this is a, a large table of all the countries in the world um, that reported on colorectal cancer. And you can see us here in North America with an incidence of colorectal cancer of 32.8 in uh, females and 44.4 in males. Um, there's a little bit of a greater preponderance of males in this uh, data, but if you compare that to the middle of Africa, they have a very low rate of detected colon cancer. And they think that has something to do with the diet and lifestyle. So let's just talk again about why we choose the ages that we do for colorectal cancer. We know that the risk of colorectal cancer increases with age. We know that at about 40, that increase starts to really pick up. 
And so here at age 40, this is where we're, we're starting to recommend those screenings of those patients who have increased risk, those family history of polyps or cancer, um, or a, a family history of a polyp syndrome that might indicate a greater risk. There are some screenings that happen much earlier, but for us today, we're talking about 40. Now, most colon cancers will develop over here between age 50 and 60. So you really wanna pick a year, a time, that is before the development of cancer. And that's why we originally had chosen age 50 as the appropriate age to begin colorectal cancer screening. For all the reasons we talked about before, it may be appropriate in some populations to begin screening sooner. So let's talk about protective factors. Well, high fruits and vegetables in your diet are, is a moderate protective factor, 50% less risk of colon cancer. So your mother was right, eating your fruits and vegetables is important. Uh, there is a modest risk, 10 to 40% less risk if you're doing regular exercise, if you have some dairy in your diet, if you take any Motrin or Advil, if you have adequate folate intake, uh, relatively high calcium in your diet, um, if you have fiber in your diet, if you have fish in your diet, soy or methionine. Now, this is an interesting study done by Platts et al. and it was published back in 2000. Um, and it talks about the proportion of colon cancer risk that might be preventable if we took a bunch of middle-aged men in the US and did something different with their lives. So it looked at their risks. So their study was to look at the estimated proportion of colorectal cancer risk attributable to anything modifiable, your diet and your lifestyle. So they looked at 47,000 people and they looked at all the risk factors, obesity, activity level, alcohol, smoking, red meat, and folate. And they looked at the population attributable risk to those variables. And they saw that if you had more than one risk factor versus none, you had a 71% population attributable risk, meaning those risks were real. And they concluded that if all middle-aged US men modified those risk factors to those with the group of the lowest scores, then a significant proportion of colorectal cancer could be avoided. And that's important uh, to know. Yogurt consumption and the risk of colorectal cancer is a study from Italy, from Pela et al. in 2011. And they wanted to see if fermented dairy products like yogurt could protect against colorectal cancer. Um, and they looked at a prospective study of 45,000 people over 12 years and they asked them some questions. And they found that colorectal cancer was lower if you had more yogurt. Now, some would argue that a Mediterranean diet and lifestyle also didn't help, but in the most uh, yogurt eating population, you had a 40% less risk. So in conclusion, um, high yogurt intake was associated with a decreased colorectal cancer risk. So should yogurt be a part of the diet or possibly we should all travel to the south of Italy and enjoy a Mediterranean diet we can definitely uh, stomach a little bit of yogurt now and then. So let's talk again about family history and colorectal cancer risk. So in the general population, no family history of colon cancer, your lifetime risk of colon cancer is somewhere between seven and 8%. Whereas if you have a first degree relative with colorectal cancer over 50, then your risk uh, rockets upwards. And if you have a first degree relative with colorectal cancer who is less than 50 at that age, the age of diagnosis, then you get over a 20% risk of lifetime colon cancer. If you have two first degree relatives with colorectal cancer, your risk is up in the teens. And if your mother and father had colorectal cancer, you go up to a 30% risk or more lifetime of colorectal cancer. So these are really the things that we can't change but we need to learn about them and we need to share them with our families so that we understand what our risks are and can make um, the right moves to screen for colon cancer. So there are a few hereditary forms of colon cancer. There's Lynch syndrome and familial adenomatous polyposis. Lynch syndrome has a series of criteria that you may meet. Again, it's, there's a certain um, uh, series of different types of cancers that can run in families that indicate that you're at higher risk for Lynch syndrome. Um, and familial adenomatous polyposis. Most people know that they have this. Um, they have, uh, their colon is just carpeted with little, little polyps, uh, and this tends to run in families. Um, so for right now, what you would need to know is if 
someone in your family has familial adenomatous polyposis, you should talk to your doctor about whether you're at risk too. So there are some features of hereditary colon cancer. There's young colorectal cancer, young members of the family with polyps. There's people with many polyps, so more than your average number, multiple members with colorectal cancer or multiple generations of the family with colorectal cancer. And any other cancers in the family, like uterine or ovarian cancer, those are also things to know and learn about and to talk with your doctor about. Now, let's talk about some symptoms of concern. So a screening for colon cancer is traditionally done when someone does not have any symptoms. They just are there for their screening. But if you're having any symptoms of rectal bleeding, black stool, abdominal pain, a change in bowel habits, or unexplained weight loss, that deserves an investigation promptly. You don't have to wait until you're 40 if you're having those symptoms when you're 35. You need to talk to your primary care doctor. You need to get checked out. I think it's important to understand that there's a difference uh, between screening and a diagnostic exam to find out some answers about your symptoms. So let's go back to talk a little bit more about those screening modalities. So for an average risk person, a 50 year old with no personal or family history of colorectal cancer or polyps, what can you do? Well, there's the fecal occult blood tests. Those are the stool tests, the fecal immune testing, and the stool gene testing. And then there's sigmoidoscopy, barium enema, virtual colonoscopy, and colonoscopy. The multi-society task force did a ranking of the current colorectal cancer screening tests into different tiers. Tier one was the most highly recommended. And they recommended a colonoscopy every 10 years and an annual fit test. And tier two uh, is the CT colonography, the fit DNA test, and a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Those tests, again, need to be done more frequently because they're not as effective as the other methods. There is a capsule colonoscopy, which is coming to the market. It's currently listed as a tier three test because of its cost um, and the fact that if you found a polyp, you would still need to get a colonoscopy to get it removed. There are other tests that are in development, and that is good news for all of us, but they're not here yet, and they're not recommended on the, by the multi-society task force. So this is what that good old fecal occult blood testing looks like. You put a little um, rod into your poop and you spread it on the card, and that's how we find it. There's fit testing, same type of thing. You put a little poop in a cup and you smear it on the a test card and then you go with that and it's pretty accurate. This is a sigmoidoscope and this is where it can go. It can go up into the left hand side of the colon and get a good look and remember 60% of colon cancer is found on that side of the colon um, and so that's a good modality for looking at that left side of the colon. It doesn't reach the right side of the colon and so you may miss 40% of colon cancers. This is a barium enema we don't use these very much anymore, but they are available, especially for somebody who is unable to get some of the other methods. This is a virtual colonoscopy. Um, the interesting part of a virtual colonoscopy, you still need to take the bowel prep and cleanse yourself um, usually, and then you'll go lie on the CT scanner and they take um, uh, pictures of your colon with the CT scanner and then they reconstruct them and then they fly through your colon virtually looking for pus. And this is a picture of a colonoscope. And this is where the colonoscope will go. It goes up into your colon all the way around. You can see both the right-hand side of the colon and the left-hand side of the colon and everything in between. So if you're above average risk and you have a family history of colorectal cancer, a hereditary colon cancer, or an inflammatory bowel disease, then really um, you want to screen younger. For some people with hereditary syndromes, you may even start screening at 20 years old. And that's something you should talk about with your doctor and a colonoscopy is the best test for these higher risk patients. So this is just a glimpse at the whole country and the current rates of screening. We had some targets. We really wanted to reach 80% of the country um, by I think 10 years ago, that didn't happen. So we're working hard now. As you can see, most of the country is only 50 to 60% of patients getting screened. We really need to work all together to get our colon cancer screening to reduce the rate of colon cancer in the country. Um, and this is the death rate of colon cancer over time. As you can see, it's falling, and that's probably due to the fact that we're doing some screening early, but there's still some discrepancies and some disparities that we need to address. I think it's most important that everybody 
has a doctor that they trust and they get uh, seen on a regular basis. Even during the middle of COVID, it's still safe to see your doctor. So to recap the important points, colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of colon cancer death, of cancer death in the US. It starts out as an adenomatous polyp and then it goes uh, from there. 80% are environmental and 20% are genetic. Diet and lifestyle measures can be very important factors. There are specific hereditary colon cancer features that may make it um, a good idea to get screened earlier and more often. And there are multiple options for screening. As, as always, the right test is the one that we can get done for you. But um, in anybody who's got above average risk, a colonoscopy is the recommended test. So again, it's really important to talk about colon screening. When we openly talk about screening choices, we make better decisions. And as you can see, when you get the right family history and you ask other people in your family, you can guide your own care and the care of your children much better. As families, we need to work together to help share and understand risks for colon cancer. And as doctors, we need to be asking these questions, but this is why your doctor may ask some, it seems like a little bit silly when I'm just getting checked out for my colon to ask about your whole cancer history, but this is why it's so important to ask. When does colon cancer screening start? Well, anyone over the age of 50 would benefit from screening for colon cancer. Who else needs screening? African Americans, according to the new uh, guidelines, may benefit from colon cancer screening beginning at the age of 45. And this is also an American Cancer Society recommendation. Who needs a colonoscopy? If you're having symptoms, change in bowel habits, rectal bleeding, dark stools, or weight loss, that's when colonoscopy is gonna really help find you some answers. How long do we screen? Well, we continue surveillance for colon cancer for quite some time, um, and we modify it based on um, how uh, your colon uh, polyps are detected. If you have more polyps, you may come more often. If you don't have any polyps, we may see you every 10 years. If polyps are found during screening, more frequent follow-up colonoscopy is recommended, and we talked about those guidelines that uh, dictate what we should be doing right now. It is recommended to consider stopping screening colon cancer uh, at, at age 75, but that's a discussion between you and your primary doctor and based on your life expectancy and what's going on um, with you physically at that time. So can you get colonoscopy right now? Yes, it is safe in most areas. If your um, hospital or doctor's office is open, it is safe to get colon cancer. Although COVID-19 is affecting the US widely right now, Doctors and hospitals have developed really good safety and cleaning protocols to reduce your risk. And you're probably safer going for your colonoscopy than you are going out to have uh, lunch with someone else because during your colonoscopy, you'll wear a mask, everyone will wear a mask, and you'll stay protected. Um, it is also safe to go get your routine care performed. Um, and I think it's really important to make sure you don't skip any of your screening exams. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and be safe. If that's all the time you have, and I think I'm glad you were able to stay with me so far, remember to get referred for colon cancer screening. This is Will Smith, and he vlogged his colonoscopy. Lots of other celebrities have gone online and showed um, themselves, and he was actually really upset because he did have a polyp. Um, so it was a really good idea for him to get screened. It's a really good idea for you, too. Thank you. Now we're going to look at some questions, I think. So let me see what we've got here. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to open the chat, but I'm having some trouble with that. Let me see. At age, let's see here. What should I do if it hurts a lot to go to the bathroom? Good question. Um, so that's a good time to see your doctor. Um, sometimes hard stools will cause uh, uh, things to hurt um, as they pass through. You can also get little tears in the lining of the rectum that can hurt or the lining of the anus that can hurt. Um, and your doctor may be able to see that little tear and give you some medications to heal it up, soften your stool and make it go away. Sometimes rectal pain can indicate that there might be a problem like a cancer, an anal cancer, or a rectal cancer, and so that's why it's really important to go see your doctor. Um, 
this is another question. Um, both my mother and my mother-in-law died from colorectal cancer in their 50s. Our family is taking all of the necessary precautions to protect ourselves. My question is this, are there any studies or trials where healthy volunteers with family history are needed? Hopkins served my mom well, and I'm willing to do my part to help future generations. That's a great question. So Frank Giardello has been here at Hopkins for many years, and he has a cohort of patients who have polyp syndromes, polyps in their family. Now, your, your mother-in-law is not technically biologically related to you, but your mother having colon cancer in the, in the 50s is um, something that um, puts you at higher risk. Um, and there are um, some studies going on at Hopkins that you may be able to be a part of. Um, I, don't, I don't know the exact criteria right now, but thank you for volunteering. That's a great idea. Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit now about bowel preps. Um, because I didn't get a chance to talk about that before. You know, a lot of people um, are worried about the bowel prep because about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the only preps that were available were really large volume and it kind of didn't taste good. Now we've got small volume preps, which were small four ounce cups. You drink one cup, you drink a second cup a little later, you have some water juice Gatorade in between and that's all you have to do. There are also some newer preps being developed that are not quite out yet, but they're um, edible. So you eat the food that's made of the prep material. So we're trying our best to make colon cancer uh, screening a little easier. I would say that the prep is the hard work that you do for us um, and a good quality prep, meaning uh, you're able to evacuate all the stool from your colon, gives us the best quality views. And by seeing the colon lumen or the mucosa really well, we get a great glimpse at the lining and we can find all of the polyps before they develop into cancer. Okay, um, there are some questions about uh, different syndromes, so let's talk about this uh, person. Um, I just had a colonoscopy and three polyps were found. One was three millimeters in the cecum, one was six millimeters in the descending colon, and one was 10 millimeters in the descending colon. They were all resected and retrieved, and a recommendation was to have another done in a year. Well, so there's a couple of things. Yes, it's still okay. Um, she's, that's what she's asking. It depends on the bowel prep. So if your prep wasn't pristine, meaning perfect, sparkly clean inside the colon, and they missed a portion, they'd be really worried with three polyps that they might have missed something important. So I think that's okay. I'd encourage you to talk to your doctor. Uh, oh, another good question. How long does it take polyps to form? That is a great question. So polyps in the traditional polyp pathway that I showed you take about seven to 10 years to form. And that's an average. Um, there are some polyps that grow faster and they come back sooner. So the sessile serrated polyps have a little bit of a different pathway and they can grow and develop a little faster. And that's why we bring you back more frequently if you have one of those polyps. For regular um, polyps development, um, it can take about 10 years. Um, what is a tortuous colon? So um, every body is different. And in some people, there is a straight line, straight line and straight line, and that is their colon three straight lines. It's a beautiful thing to do. It's a rapid colonoscopy. Um, other people are designed differently. They have an M shape. They have a W shape. Uh, so a tortuous colon is often one that's got a lot of twists and turns and is a little bit harder to get through. It's still possible to reach the end of a tortuous colon. You just have to be a little more skilled to reach the end. Okay, um, here's another question. My mother was diagnosed with advanced colon cancer at age 89. My sister has FAP. Other siblings have polyps. What is my risk? That is a great question. If your first degree relative has FAP, which is familial adenomatous polyposis, your risk is very high for polyps. Um, and you should probably find out if your sister has already had genetic screening if she has a screenable genetic test, then you can get that screening too. I encourage patients who have a family history of familial adenomatous polyposis to get assessed by a genetics counselor 
who can talk with you about your risks and really take a very detailed history of all the types of polyps to give you a better assessment of your risks. Um, but I think it's important that you have a gastroenterologist working with you as well as a genetics uh, person. Um, okay. Uh, another question. My sister, age 62, was recently diagnosed with stage four colon cancer that had moved on to the liver. She was asymptomatic. How does this happen without symptoms? Well, the colon is not the most sensitive place um, and the colon polyp development can move very quietly, very slowly. Um, it's possible that she did have some mild change in bowel habits that she just didn't really notice. Um, but some people don't have a lot of symptoms, and that's why we get screening for all patients regardless of whether they have symptoms or not. Um, there's another question. Um, a family member had a brain tumor that was a stage two cancer. He had a surgery. Now he has colon cancer, stage three. Could that be related? Yes, there are some um, brain cancers that are related to colon cancers. Again, I'd encourage him to talk to his oncologist. Often they're doing some testing on the colon cancer, um, especially when it comes with other cancers to see if there's something going on in the genes that might be affecting his risk. Uh, okay. Um, another question. So my father was diagnosed with colon cancer at the age of 65 and passed away from it at 70. I had my first colonoscopy at 50. Is it time for another? I am now 58. Yes, I would probably have you get colonoscopy every five years with a family history and a first degree relative because it sounds like he had the colon cancer a little earlier than 65. Um, but again, you can talk with your um, doctor to see what was present on the last colonoscopy and how good of a quality exam it was. Okay, so the NSAIDs, there is some uh, the, uh, there are some questions um, that have been coming through about um, Motrin, Advil, and other NSAIDs. Um, so there is some data that Motrin, Advil, NSAIDs, etc., can reduce the risk of colon cancer. What does that mean? It means people who reported using those medications in a large population study had less polyps and cancer. So it doesn't mean that one causes the other, but it just was an association. Um, and it's one that's being studied now to see if we can reduce risk. Um, those medications, those NSAID medications, do have some risks to the kidneys for GI bleeding so, and, and for heart disease. So it's something that at this time we're not routinely recommending, but it's something on a, on a trial basis. Um, what is diverticulosis um, located in the sigmoid and descending? Diverticulosis are little pockets in the colon. So the colon is a long tube, and then there are little pockets that can form. Those little pockets are called diverticula. Um, if you have lots of little pockets in your colon, that's called diverticulosis. Um, and so those little pockets can get jammed up with stool, or they can get infections in them. Sometimes they can bleed, but lots of people have diverticula, those little pockets, and they never notice them. So that's the majority of patients, and they can be found all throughout the colon. Just waiting on a few more questions here. Okay, so my brother, here's another question. My brother had colon cancer and had part of his colon removed along with his bladder and prostate. He had an ileostomy bag, then a failed reconnect twice, and now a colostomy bag. His iron levels are dangerously low. What causes iron absorption problems? Well, iron can be um, absorbed in the terminal ileum, which is the very end of the small bowel. Um, it's also absorbed up in the duodenum and higher. Um, so sometimes um, anything that affects the small bowel, meaning having part of it removed, could reduce his ability to absorb iron. Um, and so that's something that he should get checked out about, um, especially if you're having iron uh, deficiency, anemia, and you have a history of colon cancer, you probably need to get checked and make sure that your stomach, your small bowel, and your colon are still okay. Um, is there any way to reduce getting pockets like diverticula in the colon? That's a great question. So the largest study that we have on diverticula 
um, is the Nurses Health Study, and they looked at lots of people, tens of thousands of people, um, and they looked to see what happened to them. And what we always told people was that nuts and seeds get stuck in the diverticulum and cause diverticulitis, so don't eat them. What they found in the study was that the people who reported eating the greatest quantity of nuts and seeds had the lowest risk of having diverticulum. Um, we know that fiber is helpful and healthy for the colon. We know that constipation um, is an issue. Um, and when you are constipated and strain at stool, you can stretch the lining of the colon and cause more diverticulitis form. So eating a high fiber diet, um, healthy fruits and vegetables, that would be important uh, to do to help reduce the risk of further diverticulosis. Um, okay. So I think we can also talk a little bit about um, some of the other modalities of colon cancer screening. Um, just a little bit more in depth while we're here. Um, so a CT colonography, that's where you lie down on the CT scanner and you go through uh, the, the CT scan. Um, you do have to kind of clean out the bowels a little bit, um, but you don't have to get the sedation for the procedure and it's over pretty quickly. In that test, they fly through the colon virtually um, using 3D computer animated technology and they look for polyps to form. That test is effective at finding larger sized polyps, so things less than five millimeters they're not gonna see very well on that test or flat lesions they're not gonna see very well, but other lesions they will see. Um, but that's not usually an option for most patients because it's kind of an expensive option. It is an option if you have a reason why you cannot get a colonoscopy done. So if you're high risk, you're, you have heart disease and you're on multiple blood thinners that it's not safe to stop, then a CT colonography may be the right first test for you. Are probiotics helpful in reducing colorectal cancer risk by keeping the environment and the bowels more friendly? That is a great question. We don't really have the answer. We have that data from the yogurt uh, study where yogurt is technically kind of probiotic. I don't know of any specific probiotic targeted to the colon that really reduces colorectal cancer risk, um, but we know that eating a healthy diet is helpful. Eating a Mediterranean diet is helpful. Eating less red meat is helpful. Not none, but less. Um, and not having an excess of alcohol and not smoking but I don't think doctors usually recommend smoking for any reason. So I'm gonna officially say don't, don't smoke cigarettes. Okay, um, here is another question. My sister had an FAP gene. Siblings have many polyps. Mother has colon cancer. I had a colonoscopy a few months ago with one non-cancerous polyp, three millimeters. Doctor said I do not need to be screened for FAP. Is this correct? What about my sons? So if you have more questions in a family history like that, um, it is unlikely with one small polyp that you have FAP. FAP is the entire lining of the colon carpeted with polyps. Now, it is possible to have something called attenuated FAP, which is a milder form of FAP. And I don't know how old you are, um, but depending on what age you get screened, if you were anywhere between 20 and 40 and you only have one tiny polyp, it's unlikely that you have FAP. It's not impossible. And again, the best way to answer those types of questions is to talk to a genetic counselor. Okay. Um, on one colonoscopy, I had diverticulitis. Three years later with colonoscopy, I was told I don't have it. Does diverticulitis go away? Good question. So there's diverticulosis, which are those little pockets, and diverticulitis, which is infection and inflammation around those little pockets. So yes, sometimes you can get an infection or inflammation around the pockets called diverticulitis that will clear up over time. Diverticulosis, those pockets usually don't go away, but with a healthy diet, some people can reduce their risk of letting those get bigger. Um, there you go. Uh, one more question. What amount of red meat would be considered acceptable once a week? Any guidelines? Um, again, the study just talked about who ate more and who ate less. Um, I think once a week is a good amount of red meat. 
other people would argue that a vegetarian diet or pescatarian diet or chicketarian diet, something that doesn't include red meat is a little safer. I think that's a personal decision and you can talk about that um, based on how much other healthy proteins you're getting in your diet. Um, okay. I'm going to leave the juvenile polyposis syndrome uh, question. Um, there is a question about juvenile polyposis, but that's a very specialized polyp syndrome and they uh, require really intensive monitoring. Um, and the polyps do continue to come um, into adulthood. Okay. Um, so I, I think we finished the, the questions. Um, and I think um, we can talk just a few minutes about a healthy lifestyle and diet and how that works um, to prevent colon cancer. Um, so if you are thinking about the right amount of fruit and vegetable intake, you're looking at four to seven servings a day of fruits and vegetables. What I recommend people do is what we think of as a serving might not be the actual serving of food. So you got to go kind of do your measurements of how much. They're talking about a cup of this and a half a cup of that. Um, for your serving size. So that's an important thing to, to know. But it is important to get those fruits and vegetables in. Those are protective for colon cancer, and those can also help with weight control and diabetes control. Now, if you have gained the pandemic 15, which many of us have, um, exercise and a healthy diet are really important. Um, and when you think about what to do, what can you do to prevent your risk of colon cancer, this year, while you're in quarantine, it would be to eat a healthy diet um, and to exercise, but also to spend this time Zooming with your families, finding out your family history, getting those things written down that will help your doctors to understand your risks. And if you've always been afraid to, to get a screening test, there are screening tests that are non-invasive, they just poop in a cup. And if you get started there on your screening pathway, that's still okay. Um, and it's, it's better than not doing the test at all. I know a lot of people are scared um, and that's why they don't go get checked out. Um, the Cologuard test, if, if you get it right now, um, they mail it to your house. You don't even have to leave your house to get it. So if you're really scared, um, then that's something you can do and still get your screening done this year. However, right now, if you wear a mask, if you stay six feet distanced from other people, um, you can definitely get to the doctor's office and be safely cared for. Um, I think that's important to know and it's important not to wait when you're having lots of symptoms um, to make sure that you get checked out. Um, we're seeing um, that some people um, in the wake of, um, you know, being scared about leaving the house are having uh, later stages of heart failure because they missed an opportunity to intervene when they were having a heart condition that got worse. So we don't really want to let conditions get worse just because of COVID. We wanna be taking care of all of those medical um, conditions that are going on. Um, and I think it's important if you don't have a primary care doctor that this is a good year to find one. Um, and everybody should be considering getting their flu shot this year to help uh, reduce their risk of getting the flu, which looks a lot like getting COVID. Um, and it can make uh, it a lot less likely for you to get seriously sick with the flu. Um, so that is recommended this year as well. Getting the flu shot won't reduce your colon cancer risk, but it most certainly will um, help you reduce your risks overall for this year. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and I think uh, a lot of questions have come in about um, family members and getting those family members um, treated and screened and when to get colonoscopies done. Um, I think it's important to um, make sure that you're uh, getting your colon cancer preparation, I mean your colon cancer screening preparation done well. So if you're going to get a colonoscopy, you want to make sure that you get a really high quality uh, bowel cleanse done before and that your doctor will give you that medication and if you follow the instructions you'll be really cleaned out. For the other stool tests there are some instructions that come along with it. It's important to read those instructions so you get a high quality test. Um, and if you're still concerned and you want to talk to a gastroenterologist, um, we're always here um, and you can always have a visit to talk about colon cancer screening. Um, and in, in a lot of places, that's something that, that you can do even a little bit before 
uh, you would usually do it. Well, I think um, right now we've reached the end of the hour. Um, and I think everyone who attended today or is going to talk to their family about colon cancer risks, I really applaud you for taking this time out for your health today. It's really amazing to see people so interested. If you just convince one more person to get their colon cancer screening, you might save their life. So I thank you for your efforts today to learn about uh, colon cancer screening. I really um, applaud everybody who asked lots of questions. Um, keep asking questions. Um, that's what we're here for. Um, and at Hopkins, um, we have a colon cancer screening program. If you're interested in colon cancer screening and you, you don't have a primary care doctor, you just wanna call and get screened and you're 50, you can definitely call in. Um, we have a direct access program and a nurse will talk with you or a scheduler will talk with you and get you scheduled for your exam. Um, we have appointments available now. And I know there are doctors all over the country um, in your neck of the woods if you're coming in from far away and they've got time available now um, in most states, the COVID situation is okay, and it's safe to come out and get screened, and this is a great thing to do for your health. Um, a lot of people like this time of year because it's the end of the deductible time of year, so it's a time when the colon cancer screening may get more robustly covered, um, and so this is a great time of year to get things done. I, I want to thank everybody for coming today, um, and this will be posted online later, um, and thank you all for um, listening uh, and talking with me today.